starts with question 1.1. This section starts with question 1.1, which reads as follows. Which physical quantity is equal to the rate of change of momentum? And we know from the formula sheet that the rate of change of momentum or the rate of change of anything is the change of that thing over time. And we can see from this formula that that would then be net force as the correct answer, option C. Question 1.2 reads, the gravitational acceleration on the surface of planet of radius r is g. The gravitational acceleration at a height of 2r above the surface of the same planet is now the formula for gravitational acceleration is equal to the gravitation constant multiplied by the mass of the planet divided by the radius of that planet squared. And what we can now see is we can see that when they are asking for a distance or a height of 2r above the surface of the planet, we need to remember that that is a distance 2r from the surface, but the surface is still a distance of r from the center of the planet, which is what we use for our measurement for this formula, which means that they are actually asking the question, what is gravitational acceleration a distance 3r from the center of the planet? So we can say our new gravitation is equal to gravitation constant, which is unchanged, the mass of the planet, which is unchanged, but it is now a distance of 3r squared, which means that we can then rewrite that as gm over 9r squared or simplify that to 1 over 9 times gm the mass of the planet over r squared where we can now see that this is identical to our original expression for g which means that our new gravitational acceleration is 1 over 9 times g or simply g over 9 which means that the correct answer then is option a Question 1.3 reads, a ball falls from an edge of a table, ignore the effects of air friction, which one of the physical quantities associated with a ball during the fall remains constant? And since the force of gravity is the only force acting on this object, we know that its momentum is going to continually increase as it speeds up, its kinetic energy will increase as it speeds up, and the gravitational potential energy will decrease as it falls, which means that the correct answer to question 1.3 is A. Question 3. Question 1.4 is also a momentum and impulse question. It reads as follows. Two trolleys X and Y of masses M and 2M respectively are held together by a compressed spring between them. Initially, when they are stationary on a horizontal floor, as shown below, ignore the effects of friction. The spring is now released and falls to the floor while the trolleys move apart. The resultant, excuse me, the magnitude of the momentum of trolley X while it moves away is. And as we know that since these objects were stationary to start with, that means that the sum total of the initial momentum must be zero, which since we have been told there is no friction, that tells us then that the final momentum must also be zero. Now, since one object is moving off in this direction with a certain momentum, the only way in which this object can be moving off uh, in the opposite direction is if it has an exact opposite momentum. So the magnitude of the momentum of trolley X must be exactly the same as the magnitude of the momentum of trolley Y. They haven't asked for the direction, they've asked for magnitude only, and so the correct answer there is option D. Question 1.5. An object is dropped from rest after falling a distance x. Its momentum is p. Ignore the effects of air friction. The momentum of the object after it has fallen a distance 2x is. And in order to answer this question, we need to start with the formula Vf squared is equal to Vi squared plus 2g delta x where they tell us this object is dropped, which tells us that the initial velocity must be zero, and we can therefore rewrite an expression for our final velocity as 2g delta x, where the initial object we have been told is, has a momentum p, and what matters here is the velocity, because obviously the mass of this object does not change. 
And so we say the velocity of this object after falling a distance x must be 2g times that distance x. Now for this object, once it has fallen double that distance, we can now rewrite this expression to say that is 2g times 2x because the distance is now doubled, which gives us 2 times 2gx, which as we can see is exactly or can be rewritten as 2 times 2gx or just 2 times this original velocity and that is note there that is a root 2 and so because we can now say that the new velocity is root 2 times bigger than the original velocity we can therefore safely say then that the new momentum is going to be root 2 times the initial momentum so the correct answer there option b question 1.6 which reads as follows a police car with its siren on is traveling at a constant speed towards a stationary sound detector the siren emits sound waves of frequency f and speed v which one of the following combinations best describes the frequency and speed of the detected sound waves so we know that the sound emitted by the police car siren does not change we know that the only reason why it changes is because it is moving relative to the observer. It is the observer that is detecting a different frequency. So because we have been told the police car is moving towards this observer, those waves are obviously going to bunch up, which means that the observer is going to detect a higher frequency. And obviously this has no effect of the speed of sound through air, which means that our correct option is option D. Important here to note that this is only the detected frequency that changes. It does not mean that the frequency that is emitted actually changes. So the answer to question 1.6 D, you'll note that I prefer to read the question and then consider what the answer should be before moving on to the options because the options can often be quite confusing and I encourage you to do the same. Question which is question 1.7 which reads as follows. Two identical spheres R and S on insulated stands carrying charges of positive and negative Q respectively are placed a distance apart. Sphere R exists an electrostatic force of magnitude F on sphere S. The two spheres are now brought into contact and returned to their original positions. The magnitude of the electrostatic force that sphere R exerts on sphere S is now. And what we need to see here is that once they are brought into contact, they share charge with each other. And we use our charge sharing formula, which says that the new charge on either or both of the objects is the sum of the two charges. And in this case, the sum of the two charges divided by 2 because there are two of them that are sharing the charge and that tells us that the new charge on each of these two spheres is 0 coulombs. Now obviously if there is no charge on either sphere that means that the electrostatic force that exists between them will be 0. So the correct answer to question 1.7 was A, 0. With a multiple choice question, question 1.8 which one of the following graphs best represents the relationship between potential difference V and current I for an ohmic conductor? An ohmic conductor refers to a conductor that obeys Ohm's law, where we know that Ohm's law tells us that the voltage over a conductor is directly proportional to the current passing through that conductor. And what that tells us is that as the current passing through a conductor increases, the voltage across that conductor will increase in a direct proportional relationship, which tells us that the only correct answer is option B, which shows that as current increases, voltage increases in a directly proportional relationship. Question 1.9, a multiple choice question, which reads as follows. Which one of the following combinations regarding the energy conversions in electric motors and electric generators is correct? And we know that a motor always converts electrical energy into mechanical energy, which is either option C or D. And a generator always converts mechanical energy into electrical energy. 
which means that the correct answer there is option D, question 1.9, option D. With question 1.10, which is a multiple choice question, which reads as follows. Consider the statement below regarding the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect proves that light energy is quantized. We know that that is true. Two, light has particle nature. We know that that is true. And three, light has a wave nature. Now, we know that that is true, but that is not proven by the photoelectric effect. That is proven by various interference experiments that we have done. So the correct answer here, which statements above are correct, would be option C, which is statement 1 and 2 only. So the correct answer to 1.10 is option C.